Okay. Um, hey, everyone, and uh, welcome to my presentation. My name is Mons Abrahamsson, and I'm a PhD student at Erasmus University Rotterdam. And uh, what I will be discussing today is uncontroversial uh, preference purification in behavioral welfare economics, uh, which is the title of a paper that I've been working on, which is also um, the basis of this uh, presentation. And basically what I do in the, in the paper is go over this prominent critique of behavioral welfare economics and then explore the implications um, of this critique. Um, so what I will be doing in this presentation a bit more uh, precisely is firstly introduce behavioral welfare economics. Um, and just to give a bit of a pointer, prominent example of behavioral welfare economics is libertarian paternalism, which underlies nudging. And then having introduced behavioral welfare economics, I will go over the critique of the international agent. And then lastly, which is the main part of this presentation, I will go over the implications of this critique. And the broad point I want to make is basically that there's a one conclusion to draw from the critique, which is that behavioral welfare economics is fundamentally flawed. And there's a right conclusion to draw from the critique, which is that behavioral welfare economists need to put in a bit more work in order to do the type of welfare judgments they are interested in doing. But the upshot is that this is possible, at least sometimes. Um, and that is good news for nudges, for example. Um, so then onwards to the background. And firstly, I want to say something a bit more broadly about welfare economics in general. So welfare economics is about determining the value of different state of affairs. And value uh, here is commonly cashed out in terms of impact on people's well-being, which in turn is uh, often measured by the satisfaction of people's preferences. Uh, and behavioral welfare economics is one prominent uh, and quite recent strand of uh, welfare economics. And again, you can think about uh, libertarian paternalism as an example. And behavioral welfare economics um, uses true preferences as normative standard. And true preferences are the preferences people would form in the absence of reasoning impairments, such as limitations of attention, information, cognitive ability, or self-control. So broadly speaking, behavioral welfare economics can be seen to be subscribed to this idea of preference purification, which is also kind of a notion I used in the title of my talk, uh, where the idea is to not use people's reveal or actual preferences as normative standards, but kind of purify um, these preferences from these reasoning impairments, and then use these purified preferences or true preferences as normative standard. So basically the idea is that a state of affairs or a policy is better to the extent that it um, <clears throat> satisfies people's true preferences to a larger degree. Then uh, to the critique of the international agent, which is the critique that I'm interested in, uh, which is a recent and prominent critique of behavioral welfare economics that has got quite a lot of attention. And basically the starting point of the critique is that behavioral welfare economics is based on two more or less implicit assumptions. So the first one being that true preferences are subjective in nature, um, and this is an important assumption that I will return to later. Um, but for now, the most important assumption is that true preferences are context independent. Um, but that is meant that um, it's assumed that true preferences will not be affected by different kind of situational or environmental factors that are intuitively welfare irrelevant. Um, and this is important, so uh, I will explain it a bit more uh, by way of an example. So Fowler and Sunstein, uh, who are again, are kind of proponents of libertarian paternalism, which is a prominent example of behavioral welfare economics. They like to discuss this um, uh, cafeteria problem. And in the cafeteria problem, um, people's choice of different food items will be at least partially affected by uh, how prominently different food items are displayed in the store. So if apples, for example, are displayed at uh, eye level, people will tend to choose the apples. If cake is instead displayed at eye level, people tend to choose more cake. So this is an, in, uh, an instance of context dependence, um, which is problematic for welfare economists because in situations like these, it's not clear which of the two options are better for the individual in question because they choose apple in some instances, but uh, cake in other instances. So the assumption in behavioral welfare economics is that true preferences, are not context dependent in this sense. So people will consistently choose either the apple or the cake, irrespective of context. And this is good because then 
they can make um, coherent welfare judgments. But this is also where the critique kind of steps in. So the critique basically makes the point that behavioral welfare economics is based on an invalid inference. So just because people's preferences are purified doesn't mean that people's preferences will also be context independent. Um, an argument is needed for why this would be the case. So why true preferences would be context independent. And such an argument is not available in the literature and it may also not exist. So the critics give some examples um, where a person with true preferences could still make context dependent choices um, without breaking any kind of norms of rationality. But then the question is, what kind of uh, implications should we draw from this uh, critique? And here, the critics are somewhat vague. I think on one reading uh, of the critical articles, um, you can get the impression that <clears throat> the conclusion we should draw is that behavioral welfare economics is in some sense fundamentally flawed uh, and needs to be abandoned for a, a different way of doing normative economics. And here are some quotes that kind of supports this reading. But I think the first point I want to make is that this conclusion is, um, does not follow from the critique. So basically the critique manages to show that true preferences are not necessarily context independent, but from this it doesn't follow that true preferences will never be useful um, in making welfare judgment in instances of context dependent choice. And the reason for this is simply that the critique leaves open that purification can sometimes, so purification again, the removal of this kind of reasoning impairments. So purification can sometimes lead to context independent choices. And then it's possible for behavioral welfare economists to um, make coherent welfare judgments. Um, so instead of that kind of conclusion, I think the correct conclusion to draw is that behavioral welfare economists need to put in a bit more work uh, in order to do the welfare judgments they're interested in doing. So the critique nicely shows that a context independence of true preferences cannot be taken for granted. Um, and therefore behavioral welfare economists need to establish um, that observed context dependence in particular domains of interest, such as the cafeteria example, and not in general, um, can be attributed to reasoning impairments. And what I take this to mean is that behavioral welfare economists needs to establish the source uh, of uh, context dependence in uh, people's decision-making process. And this is uh, important, important to establish the source because it also determines the permissibility or justifiability um, for behavioral welfare economists to pick one kind of context-dependent choice as the correct one over other uh, of the context-dependent choices um, that are observed. And then in the last part of my presentation, I will just go over these last two points in, uh, in a little bit more detail. So firstly, what does it mean to determine the source of context dependence? So one way to approach this is to kind of set up this folk psychological view of people's decision-making process, where people uh, have or to make evaluations about options, attributes, and consequences. Um, and people hold beliefs about options, attributes, and consequences. And then on the basis of these evaluations and beliefs, people form preferences of option and then they act on these preferences when making a choice. Um, and this kind of description of people's decision-making process kind of makes uh, kind of salient that there are three kind of locations where the source of context dependency can stem from. So people can have context dependent evaluations or people can have context dependent beliefs or they can have context dependent self-control or ability to act on their preferences. And what I do in my paper is basically attributing different cases of context dependent choice to these different kind of sources in people's decision making process. Um, and this is important, uh, as I suggested before, because the source of the context dependency also determines the permissibility of correcting people's context dependent choices. So as I kind of hinted at before, another implicit assumption in behavioral welfare economics is that people's true preferences are subjective in nature. Um, so this means that if the source of the context dependency is people's evaluations, so people's evaluations are context uh, dependent, then we don't have access, so behavioral welfare economists do not have access to a good or clear or uncontroversial standard of correctness because people's subjective interest can be seen to be reflected in the evaluations people make and the relative value they assign to different attributes 
multiple options. So in order to kind of safeguard the subjective nature of true preferences, uh, people's evaluations kind of needs to be left alone. Uh, but on the other hand, if the context dependency can be attributed to people's beliefs or people's kind of ability to act on their preferences, uh, then kind of behavioral welfare economists are in business because they can introduce uncontroversial standards of correctness, which also kind of safeguard the subjective nature of um, true preferences as a whole because they do not target uh, people's evaluations. So in the case of beliefs, um, it's uncontroversial that people should have true beliefs um, or that their beliefs should correspond with reality. And it's also un quite uncontroversial that people uh, should act on their en endorsed preferences. Um, so the upshot again is that to the extent that we can attribute particular instances of context dependent choice to people's uh, context dependent beliefs or uh, ability to act on their preferences, then behavioral welfare economists are able to make uh, kind of coherent welfare judgments. So that's uh, just to wrap up also the broad point of uh, this presentation. So I've been looking at the implications of a prominent critique of behavioral welfare economics. Um, and the broad point I was making was that this critique does not show that we should kind of categorically dismiss behavioral welfare economics, but it does show that behavioral welfare economists need to put in more work in order to do to do the type of welfare judgments they are interested in doing. So behavioral welfare economists need to establish the source of particular context dependencies or context, yeah, context dependencies they are interested in. Um, and this again is important because uh, the source determines the permissibility of picking one context dependent choice over another. Um, and the upshot is that if any particular context dependence can convincingly be attributed to false beliefs or self-control problems, then we have a welfare economist can coherently uh, make welfare judgments uh, in these instances of context dependent choice. And this is good news for uh, nudges, for example. Um, so this is my uh, presentation uh, in a nutshell. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out and I'm happy to expand on parts I didn't have time to discuss uh, so far. So thank you very much.